Early in the afternoon of March 21, 1951, a Douglas C-124 Globemaster cargo ship that was part of the 2nd Strategic Support Squadron took off from Walker Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico. It was on its way to RAF Mildenhall, a Royal Air Force Station in Suffolk, England. Before it made its way across the Atlantic, however, the plane made two stops. At the first stop, at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, the flight picked up five high-ranking members of staff for the Strategic Air Command. Among them was Brigadier General Paul Thomas Cullen, who was second in command of the 2nd Air Force. The senior staffers, as well as the highly trained group of servicemen who were traveling with them, were on their way to England to help establish the 7th Air Division, which would lead any aerial assault against the Soviet Union should the need arise. The plane took off from Barksdale around 10.30 that night and headed for the Limestone Air Force Base in Maine for its final stopover to refuel. When it took off in Maine for the final leg of its journey, the plane was carrying 53 members of the Air Force, 44 who were passengers, and 9 who were serving as crew members for the flight. At 1 p.m. on March 23rd, the plane radioed Mayday to the United States Coast Guard cutter Casco, a weather ship. The plane had a fire in one of its cargo crates that the crew could not get under control. Major Robert S. Bell, who was commanding the flight, made the decision to ditch the plane. Ditching is when a pilot tries to make a controlled emergency landing on water, rather than waiting for his plane to crash into it. While ditching is very dangerous, Major Bell seemingly executed it perfectly, and the plane remained in one piece in the water. The evacuation of the plane was also executed impeccably. There was enough emergency equipment for the full number of people on board the plane, and many of them had been trained extensively for such a situation. All 53 people on board survived the ditching and put on life preservers and made it into the plane's inflatable life rafts, which carried food, water, radios, signal flares, cold water equipment, and other necessary provisions. The plane radioed all of this information to the CASCO, as well as the exact coordinates of where the plane ditched, which placed it approximately 450 miles off the coast of Ireland. The successful ditching of the plane was confirmed by a KB-50 bomber that was dispatched from RAF Lakenheath to the coordinates provided by Major Bell. The bomber's crew located the ditching site and saw the intact plane as well as the life rafts with the men inside of them. The bomber was not equipped to rescue the men, but it confirmed to the CASCO that they had the right coordinates as the ship was on its way to rescue the 53 men. The bomber then had to return to England before it ran out of fuel. While the handling of the in-flight emergency was seemingly as ideal as possible up until this point, the actual rescue effort never succeeded. When the CASCO arrived at the ditching site on March 24th, there was no sign of the plane, the life rafts, or any of the 53 men. An extensive search was conducted of the area, with ships and aircraft from both the United States and British militaries participating in the effort. No person was ever found, nor were any of the life rafts. Approximately 80 small pieces of wreckage, mainly pieces of plywood, were eventually discovered during the course of the search, but no large pieces of the plane itself. Analysis of the pieces of plywood found confirmed that they had been exposed to fire, but it could not be determined if the fire occurred while the plane was in the air or after it hit the water. Chemical analysis showed traces of chemicals consistent with incendiary bombs used during World War II, but such devices were not on the official cargo manifest of the flight. The official cargo on board was mainly empty fuel tanks. These incendiary bombs were allegedly used by the intelligence community in the early 1950s, which means they could have been in the cargo, but not listed on official manifests. While a few of the lifeboats could have been swept too far away from the ditching site to ever be found, the fact that all 53 men disappeared, and there was absolutely no sign of the plane left, created suspicions that the crew had been interfered with after they went into the water. Given the state of the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union at the time, there were concerns that the plane had been brought down by the Soviet military, and all 53 servicemen had been taken prisoner. The senior staff members, particularly Brigadier General Cullen, all had knowledge of highly sensitive information that would have been exceptionally valuable to the Soviets. The rest of the passengers and crew were mainly from the elite 509th Bomb Wing, which was vital to America's nuclear weapons program. Soviet submarines and ships were reportedly active in the area at the time the plane went down. 
Even if the Soviet Navy did not bring the plane down, it is possible that they came upon the scene and simply took advantage of the opportunity they had come across. Retired Air Force Master Sergeant Keith Amston, whose brother Robert is one of the 53 men who went missing, has a different theory about who made the men and all the physical evidence disappear. They found something, he told reporter John Andrew Prime. I think it was a broken arrow. Nobody wants to touch this thing. They're scared to death of it, and I don't know why. I firmly now believe that they were carrying a nuclear weapon. A broken arrow refers to some sort of accident involving nuclear weapons. C-124s frequently transported nuclear weapons, so the missing plane would have been equipped to carry one. The Air Force had a documented broken arrow event in 1950, and a second one just a year later could have made the United States look weak on the international stage. The pressures the Cold War put on the military may have led the Air Force to cover up the evidence of a lost nuclear weapon during its covert transport. Keith Amston's belief that there was a nuclear weapon on board the plane stems from the fact that the official search was abruptly halted and then started up again a day later. This day-long window would give the Air Force time to get rid of physical evidence, and the nation's nuclear program would be only one of a few things of a high enough importance to merit such actions. The fate of the plane and its passengers still remains unknown, and the mysterious circumstances around the disappearance still raise numerous additional questions. Four of the 53 missing men from the flight have been honored at Arlington National Cemetery, but the first of these honors was not granted until 2012. At 9 a.m. on October 16, 1972, a Cessna 310 operated by Pan Alaska Airlines took off from Anchorage en route to Juneau. Flying the small plane was Don Junes, Pan Alaska's chief pilot. The passengers on the flight were Congressman Nick Begich of Alaska and Hale Boggs of Louisiana, as well as Begich's aide, Russell Brown, who were all going to Juneau for a campaign rally for Begich, who was running for re-election that November. The flight, assuming Junes stuck to the flight plan he had filed, should have taken approximately three and a half hours. The plane never arrived in Juneau and was declared missing. Almost 100 aircraft some civilian and some military, were involved with the extensive search for the plane, which covered more than 325,000 square miles of remote and treacherous terrain. Ground searches were also organized to look for the wreckage of the presumably crashed plane. Multiple branches of the military aided in the efforts. Despite a search that lasted for more than a month, no trace of the plane was ever found. Just a month before the plane went missing, an Alaska state statute that required all small aircraft to carry an emergency location transmitter went into effect. This device was designed to send out a signal that would identify the location of a plane in the event that the plane crashed on land. No such signal was ever received from this aircraft. It is possible that this means the plane crashed in water, as the transponders of the time could not operate underwater. However, Don Junes used a portable emergency locator transmitter rather than one fixed inside of a plane permanently, theoretically bringing it with him on every different plane that he flew. The National Transportation Safety Board found his registered transmitter on a plane in Fairbanks, Alaska. He may have used a different transmitter on his final flight, or the plane flew without one that day. The most logical explanation for the disappearance of the plane is that it crashed somewhere too remote for it to be found. In the absence of the plane itself and the physical evidence it would provide, the reason behind its crash are purely speculative. The plane had been carrying six hours worth of fuel, almost double what it would have needed for its journey, so it seems unlikely that the plane simply ran out of fuel and fell out of the sky. The harsh weather of Alaska, and the potential it has to cause icing on the wings of planes, seems like a reasonable cause for the plane to crash, especially given the fact that the weather conditions on the day of the flight have been described as being barely acceptable for flying. But again, this cannot be confirmed without the plane. Given the fact that two members of the House of Representatives went missing on this flight, the possibility that the plane was made to disappear for political reasons resulted in numerous conspiracy theories. As the House Majority Leader with a decades-long political career, Hale Boggs would seem the more obvious target of an attack. Congressman Boggs had served on the Warren Commission that investigated the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. 
While he publicly defended the commission's controversial findings, rumors persisted in Washington that Congressman Boggs was not satisfied with them and wanted to reopen the investigation. Boggs also had a contentious relationship with the FBI, publicly accusing them of tapping his phone lines and those of several other members of Congress. He claimed to have proof of this accusation, but never made it public. While Nick Begich was a freshman congressman with far fewer political enemies and entanglements, he may well have been the actual target if the Cessna were, in fact, purposely brought down. Less than a year and a half after the plane he was on disappeared, Congressman Begich's widow Peggy married a bomber with mafia connections named Jerry Max Pasley. They divorced two years later. More than 20 years after the Cessna went missing, Pasley was serving a prison sentence for murder when he began cooperating with state authorities investigating unsolved cases. One of the stories he told involved him flying from Arizona to Alaska to deliver a locked briefcase at the behest of a mafia lieutenant just prior to the plane going missing. He and Peggy ran a business with the individual who sent him on this trip. One day, the man got drunk and told Pasley that there had been a bomb in that briefcase and that it had been placed on Congressman Begich's missing plane. State authorities turned this information over to the FBI, but nothing further came from the investigation. Pasley died in prison in 2010. Both Hale Boggs and Nick Begich were re-elected, presumably posthumously, in the November 1972 elections. In January of 1973, the House of Representatives passed resolutions that acknowledged that each of the congressmen were most likely dead in order to make it possible to hold special elections to find their replacements. Congressman Boggs' wife, Lindy, won the special election held to fill his seat and won re-election eight more times before her retirement from Congress. She was named ambassador to the Vatican in 1997 and served in that capacity until 2001. Congressman Begich's successor was John Young, his defeated opponent in the 1972 election. Congressman Young still holds the seat and has announced that he will be running for his 25th term in 2020. On the evening of June 23, 1950, Northwest Airlines Flight 2501 took off from New York City's LaGuardia Airport, bound for Seattle. The flight had planned stopovers in Minneapolis, Minnesota and Spokane, Washington. The plane was a DC-4 that was originally manufactured for the United States military, but was sold off to the private sector after the end of World War II, coming to Northwest in 1947. The plane at first served its original purpose, operating as a cargo plane for the airline, but in May of 1950, it was converted to carry 55 passengers. This particular flight was sold to capacity and also carried two pilots and a stewardess. The last contact with the plane came just after midnight on the 24th, when the plane, which had been flying over Michigan at an altitude of 3,500 feet, requested to descend to just 2,500 feet due to severe weather along their flight path. When the pilots were given their weather briefing earlier in the evening, this storm had not been forecast. There were other planes in the area at 2,500 feet at the time, so air traffic controllers rejected the request. The flight crew then acknowledged that they had to remain at 3,500 feet. While these altitudes seem impossibly low to modern travelers, this DC-4 was not pressurized like modern aircraft and had to remain below 10,000 feet in order to safely transport passengers. The plane failed to make contact with air traffic control in Milwaukee 20 minutes later, as it should have. The flight was hailed on all frequencies by all the towers in the region, but it could not be reached. The plane had disappeared over Lake Michigan. At the time, the presumed deaths of the 58 people on board the flight made the loss of Flight 2501 the worst commercial aviation disaster in American history. The Navy, Coast Guard, and the state police from four different states joined forces to search Lake Michigan for the plane. After the sun went up, sonar equipment and divers were brought in for an underwater search. Two oil slicks were seen on the lake, which helped narrow down the search area to the eastern side of the lake. The bottom of the lake was dragged in hopes of pulling something to the surface, but the effort did not reveal any evidence. An area larger than the state of Vermont was searched within the first two days. The plane was never located. Some debris was found off the coast of South Haven, Michigan. However, it was mainly pieces of the plane that could float, like seat cushions. Also recovered were pieces of clothing, blankets, and a rag doll. Without larger and more critical pieces of the plane, 
investigators were unable to determine what brought it down. Small pieces of human remains also began washing ashore in South Haven, but no full bodies were ever recovered. The pieces that were recovered were buried together in two communal graves in South Haven and nearby St. Joseph, both of which went unmarked until they were rediscovered in 2015 and 2008, respectively. With the location of the plane and the reason for its crash shrouded in mystery, numerous theories about the missing plane were put forth. Everything from the plane flipping over, to it exploding, to alien abductions have been theorized over the years. Beginning in 2004, the Michigan Shipwreck Research Association has performed annual searches of Lake Michigan in hopes of locating the plane, with new individuals with more advanced equipment joining the effort over time. The searches can only take place during a limited period of time each year because the equipment used in them only functions while the water in the lake is within a certain temperature range. While the MSRA has failed to locate Flight 2501, they have discovered 10 shipwrecks in the course of their searches. In 2018, the MSRA shifted its search area further south in Lake Michigan. Previous efforts to locate the plane were based on the flight's intended flight plan. The shift was a result of a theory put forth by Valerie Van Heest, director of the MSRA and author of a book about Flight 2501. She believes that the pilots of Flight 2501, after being denied their request to change altitudes to avoid the severe weather they were experiencing, diverted south to avoid the storm but inadvertently flew into the worst of it and crashed. To her, it is important to find the missing plane and confirm this theory because it will prove that the pilots were working hard to navigate out of the storm and save the plane and all their passengers until the very last moment. Van Heest is in contact with almost all of the families who lost someone on Flight 2501, all of whom still look forward to finally getting answers about what happened to the plane and their loved ones.